Hmm, I'm a little torn on what I should review next. Well, who would have seen that coming? Every few years it seems that the interactive movie type game is given another shot, and as someone who loves the idea of these types of games, I had to check out Until Dawn. One of the biggest things for me about this type of game is having your decisions actually affect the story and change what happens. When you're basically just stuck in the same story no matter what, it really makes this type of game fall flat. I'm looking at you, Indigo Prophecy! Yeah, suck it! Until Dawn isn't perfect in this matter, but it's probably the best one of these games so far for having what you say and do actually have an impact on what happens in the story and shaping the characters. Until Dawn follows a horror plot, with the group you control being stuck up in the mountains at a lodge, so of course the biggest outcome of the whole gameplay is controlling who lives and who dies, and you can save any of the characters in the game or have them get killed. Oh, uh, spoilers, I guess. Yeah, in this narrative-heavy game, it'd be a little hard to talk about a lot of it without spoiling a bit. Now that I've said there will be spoilers, let me talk about some non-spoiler stuff. Well, that choice didn't affect anything! Until Dawn follows the trend of motion-capturing the actors for all the characters in the game and having them act out the scenes to get their exact reactions. Also, the actual actors' likenesses are used for the characters, and it's actually really neat to see how much they really do look like the person who played them. I am Hayden Panettiere, and we are here at the studio recording Until Dawn. Now the characters have traits about them from the get-go, of course, but depending on what you do and say with them, it might make them a bit of a better or worse person. Michael, you're a jerk. Come on. Guys, we're all friends here, right? No need for violence, just a little harmless fun. Michael, you gotta step off. Emily and I are together now, and that's just the way it is. I'm not gonna tell you again. Do we understand each other? Well, I thought maybe we could move past all this. Be buds, but yeah, fine. Michael, I'm just gonna lay it out, otherwise this whole weekend's gonna suck ass for everyone. Um, this is super awkward, and we all know it. Let's just uh, acknowledge it now and move on, okay? Matt. I hear you, man. I get it. I don't want to make this weird. Cool. That is, to a degree, I found that the two characters that you can change how shitty or nice they are the most were Ashley and Chris. So you're basically saying that we put a vulnerable friend in a terrible situation and essentially caused her to run away and never to be heard from again. Yeah, well, it takes two to tango. Sorry? I mean, it was embarrassing, but come on, she didn't have to run into the woods half naked and upset. It's not our fault what happened. That's pretty harsh, Ash. I mean, she was really upset. I'm just saying, maybe she kind of overreacted, you know? If it was you, don't you think you would have run away? I mean, who likes being made fun of? <laughs> People don't make fun of me. To your face. What? Chris, we made her look so stupid in front of all of her friends and the guy she liked. I can't imagine doing anything worse to somebody. A lot of the other characters won't really change, like the bitchy character M. My god, that is so gross. 
Are you trying to swallow his face whole? I mean, seriously, can she be any more obvious? No one wants in on your territory, honey. Excuse me? Did you say something? Oh, did you not hear me? Was your sluttiness too loud? Sounds like someone's bitter she didn't make the cut. Yeah, it's all a big cattle call with that dream boat. Congrats, you're top cow. No matter what you do, she acts like an insufferable brat. Even when they're trying to get help, she can't follow simple directions that might save all of their lives. Not getting a signal very well. Please speak slowly and clearly. Over. Please, 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 please help. Oh my god, we're stuck on Blackwood Mountain. And there's a maniac! If you can hear this, please repeat your message as I'm unable to understand what you are saying. We need help, please! Hello? Oh god, please! Oh my god, we're gonna die up here if you don't come get us! There's a maniac! Shut up! There's no excuse! There's no excuse! I'm like, please, just try to understand. Understand the palm of my hand, bitch. <laughs> Whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was satisfying. <laughs> what? Could have been worse. Could have thrown her in a grinder. This is one of the areas where Until Dawn truly shines, and that is giving you multiple ways that a character can die. At least for some of them. And of course, I got three different deaths for Emily because I hate her! A bit too bitchy for your taste. Yes. Getting the ending where they all survive was pretty tough for me. Just because of the spot where you have to choose to not shoot him. You're, you're gonna shoot me? Like me? This is the safe room, M. <laughs> Please. How oh, can you do this? Matt, you've got to do something right now. What are you waiting for? I'm thinking. Let me think. Don't think, you idiot. Just get me out of here. <laughs> Worth it! Now, another thing that can get your character killed is. <laughs> Failing quick time events. The quick time events in this game are some of the better implemented ones that I've seen. It's just a reactionary push of a button or a motion at the right time to avoid running into something or tripping up and such. They also feel like they make sense for the most part and don't go on forever. Shit. Once again, I'm looking at you, Indigo Prophecy! <laughs> Another large element of the gameplay is picking up items to inspect them. This is how you get clues that will give you more aspects to the story, or totems, which act as supernatural spoilers in a way. These will give you a heads up on an upcoming event so you can try and avoid a death or something. The controls for interacting with items are alright for the most part, but sometimes you don't realize you have to let go of a button to initiate further examination of an object, and you can have some rather doofy moments. Oh, a book! Uh, well, what do I do with this? How do I book? Open it! Oh! <laughs> I really like some of the tasks you have to perform in this game, like quickly locking a door behind you while being chased, or holding the controller still when prompted not to move, which is the one motion control aspect that still remains when you choose to play with the regular controls instead of the motion ones. But other times, some of these tasks feel more like busy work, or the game is just throwing you a bone to make you feel feel like you've done something in an otherwise giant cutscene. Which there are a lot of. Which makes sense as it's basically an interactive movie. That said, part of this game's appeal is to replay it and achieve different results, and well, not everything is going to be different every time, so it'd be kind of nice if in the start menu you could skip previously viewed scenes after a first playthrough. What would also be nice is a run button. 
There is a lot of walking in this game, part of which adds to the mood as you go through these atmospheric parts, and I get why they don't want you just blazing through them. But again, it'd be nice if after beating the game once, you could unlock a move faster option of some sort, because a lot of these areas in this game are pretty big. Like, look at this damn lodge on the mountain. I mean, sure, the people who own it are supposed to be pretty wealthy, but for fuck's sakes, this lodge never ends. It's got a dining room, a library, a giant bathroom, bedrooms all over, corridors out the butt, a garage, a theater even and all that's before you even go down to the basement which just had me laughing about how many rooms just filled with junk it had and if that's not enough for you there's a cabin separate from the main lodge that two of the characters end up going to but no one said it was gonna be like a five mile hike to it seriously this path to the cabin from the lodge just keeps going and going and going there's even a dilapidated cabin in between the lodge and the actual cabin you're trying to get to. And this is a bit of a nitpicky thing, but it bothered me a little bit. You see that working light on this piece of shit broken down cabin? Guess what doesn't have power? Yeah. It does serve the plot that the actual cabin doesn't, but seriously, this has power and this doesn't. If these rich shitheads could afford to basically buy an entire mountain with the lodge that never ends on it, maybe they could have fixed up the cabin that actually properly receives power. Also, by the way, there's an electronically locked gate on this path. Seriously, an electronic gate that leads to a path on a mountain. Who in the fuck uses an electronic lock for that? It's the most impractical thing ever for the area, and, uh, not gonna keep anyone out. Hey, it's locked. The hell who did that? Oh, except for Matt and M, apparently. He couldn't possibly climb over that or anything. Luckily, we never see other characters just climb over things in this game, so they don't seem super silly here. Damn it, Josh. You have at least cleared out the path before sending us up here. <laughs> really? Oh, boo! Show off. Gotta get up there. <sighs> You. I fucking beat you. Truly, it's this type of thought process that led to Matt dating Emily. For real, what is it with you and going back to the lodge? You just want to hide out in your room and cry. <laughs> <laughs> Certain parts where you have to walk around are definitely more interesting than others, too, like walking around the cabin versus having to walk around the mines. You know, mine levels, they are some great. They're pretty much second only to sewer levels. Plus, you get the pleasure of controlling Emily whilst in the mines. Woo! It's truly the total package here. Oh, you didn't choose anything. Review over. Anyway, the story starts a year prior to the main events of the game, with the group you're following pulling a stupid prank on Hannah here, who has a crush on Michael. They set her up to believe that he actually wants to be with her, just to reveal that they were all watching, which of course causes her to run off like an idiot into the cold and her twin sister Beth to have to follow. But during I forgot it was really cold out here drama time, something ends up chasing them and they end up falling off a cliff. Ah! 
So obviously, coming back here exactly a year later to party, it'd be the best way to get your mind off this horrible accident, right? <laughs> First off, I gotta say, I am super excited to welcome all my pals back to the annual Blackwood Winter Getaway. Ah! <laughs> and this is set up by their brother, Josh. He seriously thought this was a good idea? I'm just, just joshing you. These people have some of the strangest parties I've ever seen, too, with part of the group getting sent off to another building due to an argument breaking out, some of the others breaking out a Ouija board, oops, I mean... The spirit board. And Sam here... I'm gonna go take a bath. Truly, this is the party to end all parties. Then again, I've never attended a get-together on the anniversary of someone who was close to me's death at the same location it happened so maybe that's how these usually go. Now, every so often, you'll end up in a therapy session with Dr. Hill, who asks a character who's not revealed for a while about what they fear and what they felt about certain characters, and how you answer here affects aspects of the game as well. Like, if you tell him you fear clowns the most, like a total dick, you'll have a clown in his office a bit later. You're sick! You're a sick fuck! If you say zombies, you'll change it to that, and he can actually start looking like a zombie near the end. His office also goes from looking pretty normal towards the beginning to very deranged as the story progresses. These sessions reminded me a lot of the ones you'd have with Dr. Kaufman in Silent Hill Shattered Memories, especially as these games share a fair amount of ideas, and having the doctor ask the player questions through another character that isn't seen until later. But it's kind of the opposite revelation in Until Dawn, as the therapy sessions with Dr. Hill are revealed to just be in Josh's head. No, it's all about you, Josh. It's always all about you. Josh apparently was actually bothered by his sister's death and went to therapy sessions with an actual Dr. Hill at some point, but now these demented versions are continuing in his head. And really, this made me like his character a bit more than before, since earlier it just seemed like, hey, let's just go party where my sister's died! Josh's mental instability also played into the fact that he was the masked person going after the rest of the group for a while in the game and put them into some Saw-like scenarios. Chris, you can take that gun in front of you and shoot Ashley, or you can shoot yourself. Whoever is left can live. I mean, how does that feel, right? How does it feel? Do you enjoy feeling terrorized, humiliated? I mean, panicked? All those emotions that my sisters got to feel once, one year ago? Only, only guess what? They didn't get to laugh it off! No! 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 They're gone! I'd have been happy if Josh's motives for having done this were solely about his sisters, but this point gets muddled rather quick. Come on, you guys are all gonna thank me when you guys become internet sensations. Wait, what? what? Oh, you better believe this little puppy's going viral, ladies and germs. I mean, we got... Unrequited love. We got, we got blood. I don't think there's enough hard drives in China to, to count all the views we're gonna get. Josh's recording of them during this shit is pretty ridiculous because he'd need a lot of cameras at the right place at the right time, which apparently he had since he's even got camera changes on some of the footage he shows. Also, he's planning on people following a lot of paths that they could easily miss to get this sort of point across. And he's got really elaborate things that he seems to be really hoping you'll bother looking at, like an old film projector with footage of the stupid prank from last year. Meaning he had to convert their digital video to film for this. Makes sense! What the shit? He also edited in jump scares, how 
modern crap horror of him. I wish his reasoning about this being for his sisters was focused on a little more because the characters really don't talk too much about how their stupid prank not only led to Beth and Hannah's death, but also damaged Josh so badly that he'd even do something like this. This also leads me to one of the game's biggest non-choices that it dresses up like it's something you can change. During one of Josh's saw-like sequences, he makes Chris choose between either saving him or Ashley from getting cut in half, which you're in control of. But not really! You can try to choose to save Josh, and it'll just pick Ashley to save anyway. The only difference in the story this causes is Josh kind of mocks Chris for it later. Now, the reason in the story that Josh did this crap is, well, he's nuts, but he just wanted to freak his friends out, not kill them, so none of his traps were actually going to be lethal. Of course, all these stupid things he pulls could very easily lead to someone getting hurt or killed, but still, he's at least got a mentally unstable excuse. And it's nice he actually has a motive, and being nuts wasn't his only reasoning behind everything, too. But no matter what, the blade cuts Josh in half here because he later reveals he had a fake body full of pig guts to pull off this trick. Which, I gotta nitpick here as his body clearly moved in ways it wouldn't if this were the case, and you can see his neck is actually attached in a way that it wasn't when it shows how he pulled this trick off. So if Josh isn't the real threat, what is? Wendigos! You don't get a choice with that either. I'm a bit of two minds about the Wendigo reveal in Until Dawn. On the one hand, I was hoping the plot wouldn't go down the supernatural route, or at least if it did, it would play more directly into the accident last year. Also, these Wendigos have apparently lived on this mountain for like 80 years or so, ever since some accidents in the old mines on this mountain, and they were also all throughout an old hotel in San which is kind of an asinine combination, so it's probably why you don't see the all hotel and sanatorium combo too often. So even though these Wendigos were experimented on in this sanatorium, no records of it ever made it off this mountain, apparently. And no one ever checked why they stopped hearing from this hospital. Meanwhile, this rich family has a giant lodge and cabins built here while never having had one incident with these Wendigos the whole time until just recently. This could have been solved if these Wendigos had been trapped in something from during the event one year ago actually freed them. Now on the other hand, the Wendigo showing up gets more action going on in the plot and does at least have some connection to the accident a year ago. As the old guy who knows the real plot but was a red herring villain earlier explains to you, someone will turn into a Wendigo on this mountain if they resort to cannibalism. And after their fall, Hannah was the only one who survived but was stuck down in part of the mines and got desperate enough to eat her dead sister. Sister. I do like how gruesome of a revelation this is, but I don't feel like it's touched upon quite enough. When you hear about this, it's near the end of the game, and it's optional for you to find Hannah's diary that actually spells this out to the characters. It just would have been nice if after finding the diary, the characters who were still surviving talked about this revelation a bit right before the end. I was also wary about the Wendigo revelation at first, mostly because of Indigo Pro prophecy, as its plot also suddenly went deep down the supernatural route, but at least until Dawn never had your character suddenly flying through the air shooting energy blasts at each other. <laughs> Indigo prophecy kinda let me down. I was much happier overall with Until Dawn's execution of the Wendigo plot because they were the only real supernatural element in the game, so that kept it a little more grounded than what Indigo Prophecy did. While I do really praise this game for giving you all these choices that affect the story, I still really wish that you could branch out what actually happens more than you really can. Like I've said, Chris and Ashley are the two characters it seems you can change the most based on your actions, but still, Chris acts a bit obnoxious at times. Hi Chris, very funny. Oh, how'd you know it was me? Come on, why are these doors locked? 
to, to keep out strangers. Hey. Uh, what? Hey. What the hell? Boom. You just got mucked. What? <laughs> oh, shit. No. Hope this is not Chris's blood. There's a few times you can fuck with animals, like have Chris be a prick and shoot a squirrel for no reason, or have Matt ask a deer a question, and this tends to lead to something bad happening. Get back! No! And funny enough, not trying to save Emily is the right call for Matt, because if he does... Get off! Get off! Get off. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley can either be really sympathetic about what happened with Beth and Hannah, or not so much based on what you have her say, which is why her personality seems like the one you can change the most. Also, in one of Josh's fake death traps, Chris can choose to either try and shoot himself or Ashley to save the other from the saw blades being lowered on them. If he fires what ends up being a blank at himself, Ashley will really appreciate that Chris was willing to try and save her over himself, but if Chris attempted to kill her, well, she gets pretty cold. Ash, Ash, come on! This thing is right behind me! Please, let me in! Ash! What, 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 are, you, what are you doing? Ashley's chance to die, though, is one of the most bullshit ones, in my opinion, because it kind of comes out of nowhere and is odd in a few ways. First, the opportunity for her to die only comes up because she wants to make sure to put a manhole cover back over the way they came to make it more safe. But Sam apparently can't wait the two seconds for her to do that. Yes, fine, close it, but we gotta keep moving. Can you just catch up, please? That's really not a ridiculous thing to do, Sam, but do you know what is? Running off really far like you can't wait for her to make things more safe for you. Hello? Who's there? Anybody? Ashley thinks she's hearing Jessica here, which as long as you race to try and save her earlier, is actually shown to still be alive just before the scene happens, but... Now there is a note in the game that mentions that Wendigos can mimic human speech, but it never actually comes up in the main gameplay, so if you never see this note before this, you have no indication here that this is something they can pull out their ass. It just would have been nice had there been some scene somewhere with a Wendigo mimicking a voice to give you a slight inclination that this might be what's going on here. Then it also wouldn't be so weird that this is the only time time a Wendigo tries to trick someone with some voice mimicking. And this is one of the spots where I don't feel that certain decisions were thought through as well for the story, because if Ashley dies here, Sam just seems to forget about her and the fact that she was supposed to be right behind her. If you help me up, I can go back to tell the others we're okay. Who? There's no others! They're all dead! Yeah, certain lines like that still get said even if the story you've unfolded makes them make no real sense. Which kind of goes with the I wish the story branched a little more criticism because this should probably call for Sam to do something else at this point instead of trying to go to tell no one what's going on. Boom. 
butterfly effect. Similarly, the point where Emily can get shot is because she was bitten by a Wendigo and the group fears it might be infectious and that she could turn into one. But after this event happens, Ashley reads a book on them and finds out that no, their bites don't infect you and freaks out a bit because, well, blowing your friend's head off because you thought they did kinda sucks. Oh no 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 no. What? What is it? What does it say? But what if Emily never makes it back at all and you never have the scenario about the bites being infectious or not. Oh no 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 what? no no. What is it? You'd is think it? in this case it'd be more of a good news thing that if you what do get that? bit by one of these Wendigos you won't turn into one. Also I do rather love that after losing it because of Emily getting shot the characters get really nonchalant about her corpse just sitting right there. Then again it is just Em so I kind of get that one. Another point kind of like this is Mike and Jessica's relationship. Depending on certain actions, Jessica will either like Mike more or less. Ah! Now this does change things a bit and gets reflected too by her state of undress once you reach that cabin on another planet and start to get it on. If Jessica is really not impressed with you, she won't even take her winter coat off. But if you are sort of okay, but also a bit of a dick, she'll take her coat and shoes off. And if she really likes you, she'll get down to her underwear. But besides what she's wearing, the scene will basically play out exactly Exactly the same with a Wendigo pulling Jessica through the window. <laughs> also, I gotta mention this, a Wendigo apparently throws Jessica's missing phone through the window of the cabin and Mike is just ridiculously casual about it. It's your phone! What? How is it my phone? I don't know, it just... Came through the window. I guess it decided to come back to you. No big deal. And another not very branchy thing about this part of the story is Jessica basically acts like she's still very into Michael during a lot of the scenes regardless of what you've done. She'll be annoyed momentarily if you do something stupid with Mike, but then it's kind of back to, well, I can't wait to fuck until you're actually about to. When Mike is exploring the sanatorium, he can make friends with a wolf, which is awesome because who the hell doesn't want a wolf pal? Or he could decide to be a dick to the wolf and it won't be too friendly. Hey, big guy. Never you see me again, huh? I was hoping I'd run into you again. All right, pal. Come with me. All right, here's the plan. I happen to see a map of this place, so we're not flying blind. There should be a way through the psychiatric wing that'll take us right outside the mine. I love, too, that it looks like the wolf is actually listening to and understanding Mike in this scene. Mike kind of starts off like he's going to be a bit of an obnoxious bro type of character, but he actually develops and becomes pretty likable. And I tended to like a lot of his quips while he is going through some of the pretty awful shit in the sanatorium. Isn't this a quaint little psycho crib? There goes nothing. Awesome. See that? I do got moves. Mike's definitely more humorous than Chris. What in God's name are you wearing? I found my true calling. Mm -hmm. Please tell me you're gonna take a vow of silence. <laughs> Hope this is Chris's blood. Mike and Sam turn into the main characters of the game because, really, they are the only two that can't die until the very last chapter of the game. Which, again, is a bit of a disappointment as far as branching the story out goes, because it'd be interesting if you could put more of a lead role on some of the other characters based on actions you'd take with them. Except Emily! <laughs> I'm glad at least besides her, you can get into these characters pretty well as the story goes along, and unlike a lot of modern horror, you don't feel like you're stuck with people you'd just rather not bother with. What are you doing? Well, actually, the towel didn't turn out to be the best outfit for fighting off killer maniacs, you know? 
Emily's the major exception to a degree, but I think it's good in a game like this. They gave you a raging asshole to have the option of having something horrible happen to. <laughs> Really, it's like the game punishes you the longer she lives because out of all the characters, she seems to be the only one who doesn't grow from the life and death experience they endure. I've played through Until Dawn three times now and done some other partial playthroughs just to explore around with what you can change and because it was fun and interesting enough for me to go through it the multiple times like that. While Until Dawn does an amazing job in some areas, overall the story you play isn't going to change all that much. You'll get some different responses or extra scenes based on what you do, but like I've said, the main changes really come down to the character's deaths, and those are really determined in the last half of the game. Also, I wish there's some more variance to the endings, because all it does is show you the surviving characters being interviewed about what happened, or it'll show you their death if you got them killed off, and that's it. It'd have been nice if there were some actual completely different different endings to achieve besides this. The biggest change you can get really is if you get Josh to realize that one of the Wendigos is Hannah. If you do this, you'll get a scene with him turning into one as well after the credits. I have a visual on a survivor. One survivor repeat. Is that? Oh, fuck. Overall, if this type of game is interesting to you, you should definitely check it out because it does a lot of things really well and it looks really nice. Just don't expect a completely different experience every time. It's just a slightly altered one. But, of course, the main thing is... I love killing them! I shouldn't have said that. Sorry, you should have chose the nice option on this non-interactive video if you didn't want me to be such a bastard.